Yeah. 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 Our favorite book of the Bible. Whose favorite book of the Bible is Leviticus? Yes, one guy back there is the favorite book. Oh, thanks. It is near and dear to the believer's heart. How could you pick a favorite? Yeah. My favorite's the table of contents. It's all right there. Yeah. So Leviticus, again, it's all direct quotes from God Himself. It is really a precious book because, and, and we've re been reminded, I'd like to be reminded that this is God speaking uh, directly to Moses. Now a lot of these uh, would have been up on the mountaintop where, where Moses would hear these things, instructions. And we've looked at Leviticus up to this point. We're in chapter 20 today, but... Up to this point, we've kind of looked at moral laws. Even way back in Exodus, we'd started with moral laws and civil laws. And then now we're, we're kind of getting into ceremonial laws, especially, especially the following chapters. We'll, we'll get a little more into ceremonial laws, and that really pertains to the priesthood and how to bring offerings to the Lord, burnt offerings, uh, peace offerings, fellowship offerings, all of those kinds of things that you and I take for granted so often because we can just come. We can gather together. We can bow our heads and pray. We don't have to bring a goat, a lamb, and slit its throat and put them on the altar and watch the blood flow and sprinkle the blood on the altar. All that stuff has been taken care of through the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus Christ. And so Leviticus will remind us over and over again of the supremacy or the importance, really, of Jesus Christ. How vital um, and how necessary the sacrifice was that Jesus would go and be the substitute for our sins. Um, what the book of Leviticus is all about, what, what it's been all about, is holiness. And in fact, we read... Last week, I wanted to touch on it one more time. In Leviticus 19.2, you could call Leviticus 19.2 the key verse for the whole book. Um, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, he said, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's the key verse. That is what the book of Leviticus is all about. You, me, us, human beings... Being holy like God Almighty is holy. And that's where we get into chapter 20 here. You kind of stop and take a breath because there's been a lot of stuff that we've looked at in detail. He's going to repeat quite a few of those things here in chapter 20, but we're going to see a difference, I think, from all of the stuff we've looked at so far. So, Let's read verses 1 through 5, and I hope we finish today. Um, Leviticus 20, verses 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses again, saying, Thou shalt say to the children of Israel again, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that gives any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man, and I will cut him off from among his people, because he has given of his seed unto Molech, to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man when he gives of his seed unto Molech, and kill him not... Then I will set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut him off and all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. So 
this first section, again, it is revealing what it means to be holy, to be different from the rest of culture and from the rest of the world around them at that time. And it begs the question, how am I, how are you different from the culture around you today, from the world around you today? Do you just go and do what they do? Do you go and watch what they watch? And um, the biggest difference here in, in chapter 20 is that now we have in the title of the message is Penalties for Sinning. That's the title of the message today. Up till now, it's just been you're told to do this and not to do that. And there's not really any penalties laid out. Consequences. But do not be deceived. <laughs> Don't kid yourself. There are consequences for our actions. One of the biggest, the hardest things um, about our culture and about what's happened is that consequences for our actions are covered up or somebody comes along and pays the consequence so you don't fall down and get hurt or you don't get your feelings hurt. Someone else eats the cost or whatever it might be. And the lessons, the very simple fundamental lessons in life, in life are not being learned. They're not being taught. They're not being learned. These kind of public consequences, these kind of public penalties did an incredible work in the group. There weren't that many people that started to look into Molech since this was instituted, since God put this in play. Remember Molech, the little statue that was... Uh, of the God, Moloch, the God of pleasure, the God of prosperity, the God of the Amorites. In fact, Jeremiah chapter uh, 32, in Jeremiah 32, 35, God, again, in recalling the children of Israel, says how they did this. They offered their children, gave of their seed unto Moloch. In fact, it, it states it in such a way in Jeremiah 35, or sorry, 32, 35. Let me jump over there and see. Jeremiah 32, 35. To remind us, God says, They built high places for Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not to do. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination. It was something God didn't even imagine His children would do. Just think what He's looking down and seeing as some quote-unquote Christians will not necessarily get an abortion themselves, but verse 4 and verse 5, back at Exodus 20, or sorry, back at Leviticus 20, verse 4 and verse 5. Is it just the people that are guilty of bringing their children to Moloch and placing their little infant babies on those incandescent, red-hot, glowing, <laughs> boiling, sizzling arms of Moloch and those babies would be crying? as they murdered their babies back then? No. Verse 4 and verse 5. Anyone just watching it and, just, and actually hiding their eyes from that. In other words, if you just stood by and did nothing to stop it, you were just as guilty. You should be stoned. You should be put to death. Which, again, it... it it gives people a drive. <laughs> You're not going to stand up. And, and in verse 4, it says that you kill him not. Now, we should, there's, there's a side of us that should really just agree wholeheartedly with this. Think about anyone that takes a little child 
and does something to harm them. Does something to even just abusing a child. Now this is much worse because you're killing that child. You're placing that child uh, and they, they are burnt to death, fried there on the arms of Molech. You see why God was so passionate about it? We say, yeah, why wouldn't you kill that person? And God's right along with us. We're right along with Him. Amen. That you would just hide your eyes from it and pretend it's not happening and not do anything to stop it? No, you're just as guilty. In fact, Romans 30... Or sorry, Rome, there is no Romans 30. Romans 1, 32. The last verse of Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, 32. Remember that list of all kinds of things that are an abomination to the Lord. And in fact, Romans 1 lets us know that uh, that many of the sins that are in the Old Testament carry over into the New Testament. Uh, but Romans 1, 32 says, Knowing the judgments of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, but they not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. In other words, you may not be partaking in the very act of killing a baby, but you're just standing by and doing nothing. Approving. The, our silence, your silence, when you know these, these things are happening, is your approval. It's, whether you like it or not, you're saying, I approve of abortion. By just being silent about it. And that's God's point back in Leviticus 20, verses 4 and 5. He will set His face against that man, against that woman, who hides their eyes from someone who offers their child on the arms of Moloch, committing such whoredom. And if you want to do that, God says, go that way, but don't come back into the camp of the Lord. Don't think you can, and that's why that word, a whoring, it's, it's you just go and prostitute yourself as my children, as my person, my people. And God says you're going into Molech, and that was one of many gods, one of many things that they would, would be tempted to go into. And he, he calls it, again, um, it's a graphic uh, term that we can understand. And we should not be committing any kind of uh, idolatry. And that's what, that's what that word entails. Um, I also like the way that 1 Timothy 5, 1 Timothy 5, verse 20. 1 Timothy 5, 20, Paul says this to his young, young uh, protege, Timothy. 1 Timothy 5, 20, To them that sin rebuke before all that others also may see and fear to whoever's sinning whatever the sin may be do you love them enough to openly rebuke open rebuke by the way proverbs tells us open rebuke is better greater much more precious than hidden love why why would you want to do that? So that others may see and fear. Why? Why, God, would you have them be stoned with stones so that others may see how wicked, how destructive this whole thing is? That they might see and they might fear. Well, verse 6, it wasn't just Moloch. The soul also that turns after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people Verse thir uh, if you drop down to the last verse of Leviticus 20 uh, Leviticus 20 verse 27 a man or a woman that has a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Those two verses, verse 6 and verse 
27 really go together of this strong and firm warning against what we would call witchcraft, what we would think and what movies portray as good magic. There is no such thing as good magic. I hope you know. These things are very real. In fact, I love the old King James translation because of the simple way that it, it portrays God as the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. We hear a lot about ghosts, don't we? There's a lot of movies about ghosts. A lot of mysteries and, and suspicions. Well, the only ghost you need to be familiar with is the Holy Ghost in the Word of God. It will keep you from any other ghost, fearing any other ghost. Samuel, or sorry, Saul, in the book of Samuel, was guilty of this very thing, and Saul was the king. The king of Israel. Saul was guilty of going to some witch, we would say wizard, some magi, some person that, that's looking for... And, and Saul was wanting answers. The same thing goes on today. They still thrive. They still have a business. The people that call themselves fortune tellers or palm reading. This stuff is still going on. Why is it still going on? Because it's real. All of this stuff is absolutely real. There is a spiritual realm, a spiritual world. And at, back then, they were told to stay away, not to partake, to just don't even go there. First Samuel 28, you have the story of Saul uh, looking for wisdom. Um, and in, ver uh, in just the chapter before, in Leviticus 19, in Leviticus 19.26, it says, neither shall ye use enchantments or observe times. We read that last week, but I think it's worth throwing in with that. Leviticus 19, 26 goes right along with Leviticus 20, verse 6, and Leviticus 20, verse 27. If somebody is uncertain or wants to know what they're not familiar with, that's why it's familiar spirits. I gotta know what's in my future. I'm not familiar with that, so I must go see a, a familiar spirit. Make it, make it familiar to me, that I might know what's in my future. Those kinds of things go on. But something that should be said is that demon possession can happen, but never to the believer, because of First John chapter four verse four. We don't really look out, we're not really concerned with demon possession and being possessed by a demon because 1 John 4.4 4 very clearly says greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now who is in you? Who is he who is in you? It's the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit. Verse uh, Romans 8.11, Acts 5.32, 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19, we have the Holy Spirit of the living God living and dwelling in us. I'll, ran, I'll ramble those off again. Romans 8.11, Acts 5.32, 1 Corinthians 3.16, and 1 Corinthians 6.19. It is recorded on YouTube, so you can always go back and get those. But we have the Spirit of the living God dwelling in us. It's the presence, the power, and the person of the Holy Spirit that can cause you and I to be fearless. No fear, right? The old shirt used to say. No fear. Truly, with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit living in you, it doesn't matter how many people say, that house is haunted. That place had somebody die in it last week. You can go in there totally fearless. Why? Because the fear of God, the fear of the Lord is the beginning 
of knowledge, of wisdom, of understanding, and everything else, truly, everything else is confusion. So as soon as you begin to, in the, that movie or that book or that thing starts to grab you and you fear that and not the Lord, confusion can set in. It's a trap. Stay away. Don't even go there. Don't even go to that way. Um, now verse 7 and 8 is the epitome of the book. This is what, again, getting back to what it's all about, the book, the book of Leviticus. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Now wait a minute. It says verse, six, uh, verse 7, sanctify yourselves. And then at the end of verse 8, what does it say? I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Which is it, Lord? Do I sanctify myself? Or do you? are you the one that sanctifies me? The answer is three letters. Yes. <laughs> to both. I sanctify myself and He is the only one who can sanctify me. Now what does it mean to be sanctified? To be set apart. To be made holy. That's all the word means. To be sanctified. Set apart. Made holy. Um, John 17, 17. In, in John chapter 17, verse 17, God, Jesus praying for us John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them, Lord, by Your Word. That is how we can be set apart. It's by our Word. John 17, 17. Rather, by His Word. By the Word. This is we sang before this time. His words give us life that's everlasting. Everything else will fade away, but His Word remains. And that's how we're to be sanctified. John 17, 17. By His Word. That's what's going to cause us to be set apart. It's going to make a difference. And it should cause us to be different. Somebody said, without Him, I can't. But without me, He won't. You got that? Without God, I can't. I could can do nothing apart from Him. Without God, I can't. But without me, He won't. It speaks of participation. It speaks of a partnership. See, we don't just run in and jump into a bunch of rules and regulations and those kinds of things. No, there's this relationship that's happening. Lord, I really have a problem with cable television. Click, 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 click. You know I have a problem with cable television. Click, 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 click. Lord, set me apart and sanctify me from this cable television addiction that I have. Click, 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 click. And the Lord would say, if you would tear out the cable, shut it off, you could see and I could meet you. So God is a perfect gentleman. He's always been. He's not going to force any one of us to be holy to be set apart for Him. So sanctify yourselves and He will sanctify you. There's this, this uh, partnership, this, this relationship that goes on. So, when will I be? When will you be? When will we be fully sanctified? 1 John 3, 2. In 1 John 3, 2, I love this verse. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 When will I be when will you be fully sanctified <laughs> beloved now are you the sons of God the children of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be fully sanctified if you will but we know that when he shall appear that is Jesus Christ when he shall appear we will be like him for we shall see him as he is 1 John 3, 2. That is when you will be fully sanctified. We're not going to be here on earth totally set apart, totally sanctified. It is an ongoing 
thing, just as I, I brought up, I think it was Thursday evening, about being delivered, being saved. We hear these terms, I've been saved, I've been delivered. No, you haven't. Not yet. Not fully until you're with Him. Amen? It's not until we're in His presence and we shall awake and be in His likeness and see Him as He is. So, now to the fun part. Children, obey thy parents. <laughs> For everyone that curses his father, verse 9, or his mother shall be surely put to death. And all the parents said? Amen. Amen. They used to have that on our fridge at home. <laughs> he has cursed his father or his mother. His blood will be and shall be upon him. So, again, and I think it's worth saying how children are always going to go against the authority that they've been placed under. No matter who they are, no matter how long they've been, and if you think your children are perfect little angels, just hold on. It'll get there. Every child, every child, because this is in our nature, every human goes against authority. We do not like to be told what to do or how to do it. We don't. It's just in our, it's in our nature. We always go against authority. Now, with that said, parents are not always right. And all the children said. Okay, we don't have any children here. <laughs> parents are not always right. It's a lot harder for a hearty amen in that moment, but I'll say it. Amen! Because I know I'm not. I screw up big time. And I think some of the most precious moments with my little ones, my little guys, is explaining to them how I screw up. I make mistakes. This is I'm the furthest thing from a, a role model. Son, daughter... I'm not the father, but I know the father. And I think one of the worst things in our, uh, in Christian culture, in Christian, is to think that parents can do no wrong. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Parents are human, and they mess up all the time. I know because I are one. But just as children can make mistakes, parents can make mistakes, and we should not provoke our children. The New Testament will go on to tell fathers and mothers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in God's love. And then the man that commits adultery, verse 10, the man that commits adultery with another man's wife, even he that commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. And the man that lies with his father's wife in the same way has covered his father's nakedness, both of them shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. <laughs> Their blood shall be upon them. So the, the very act of just adultery with any Anybody that's not your wife, anybody else's wife, this is adultery. Why is God so against it? Because it ruins family. It destroys, it's destructive in every way. Again, the only reason God sets these things in play, God puts these things down for us in writing. It's because He cares. He cares about every one of us. Well, if a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Do I need to elaborate all the more on that? You bet. Especially in our day. It's speaking of lying down with the same sex not being attracted to the opposite sex. Um, 
verse 13 should be highlighted and we, we'll uh, finish out the chapter and I'm going to come back to verse 13 and really hammer away on some things. But if a man take a wife, verse 14, and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, uh, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death. And ye shall slay the beast. Well, that's kind of mean. The Lord said it, so you better do it. And if a woman approaches any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man's, uh, if a man shall take his sister, uh, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness, and she shall, he shall bear his iniquity. And if a man shall lie with a woman, having her sickness, and shall uncover her nakedness, he has dis discovered her fountain, and she has uncovered the fountain of her blood. And both of them shall be cut off from among their people. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor... Uh, of thy of thy father's sister, for he uncovers his near kin. They shall bear their iniquity. And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land, whether, you, uh, whether I bring you to dwell therein, spew you not out. <laughs> it's good for the land that you walk in these things. And you shall not walk in the manner of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that flows with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. That's what the book of Leviticus, again, is all about. God separating to himself from other people. Ye shall therefore put differences, difference between clean and beast and unclean and between unclean fowl and clean and ye shall make uh, not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creeps on the ground which I have separated uh, from you as unclean and ye shall be holy unto me for I, I the Lord your God am holy and have severed you from severed you from other people, that ye shall be mine. Again, a man also or a woman that has a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Um, I meant to mention that there were even those who were becoming wizards and actually had these familiar spirits. Verse 27. So you can begin to dabble in it. And I know I mentioned we as believers with the Holy Spirit living in us, we can't be possessed. We can't become wizards. We can't get demon possessed. But the possibility is always there for anyone who opens themselves up to that world. Um, also, with the man that commits adultery, something we kind of learn a little insight on from verse 9 and verse 10 rather, um, is that a man that commits adultery with another man's wife, they shall be put to death. Um, remember in John chapter 9, or sorry, John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, we have the familiar story, the woman who was brought to Jesus caught in adultery, remember. 
And the reason that the Lord could see right through it, Jesus Christ could see right through what they were doing, is this woman who was caught in adultery was brought in. They, they even said, we caught this woman that's been caught in the very act of adultery. What does the law tell us? The reason we know they weren't interested at all in justice, <laughs> but they really were trying to trap Jesus, is a very simple question when you're reading John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, and that is, where is the man? If she was caught in the very act of adultery, according to Leviticus 20, here, what we read in Leviticus 20.10, we should ask, and Jesus would have been thinking, well, where's the man? Because it's not just her. It takes two to tango, right? So, where is the man? And, that, and it let you know right off the bat, these guys were not interested in justice. They weren't concerned about what the law had to say. They were just angry that Jesus had come and was accepting and being so uh, open and really a friend of sinners. That's what Jesus was. They couldn't stand it. Um, but this whole thing with homosexuality that's brought up in verse 13, and not only homosexuality, bestiality. It goes on from there to just the worst thing you could think. But also... Um, I guess the Lord, the reason behind the Lord forbidding any kind of homosexual activity, any kind of desire for these things, any kind of transsexual stuff, any of this stuff, it's all covered here. And the whole reason for it is just like adultery. It kills the family. It absolutely destroys the family unit. The fact of the matter is that you and I as human beings, we were made in the image of God. And all the people could say, Amen. Now God is a creator. And God is a giver. And so He has given us the incredible pleasure, the incredible uh, opportunity to be little creators. We can make a baby. A man and a woman can. They begin to create. And God actually instructs us, be fruitful and multiply. It was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, that were told that. Because it would have been impossible if it was a man and a man who was told to be fruitful and multiply. You have to make it this basic today. It, there is no other way to argue with it. This is just the way that it, it has to... As, as I said when we were reading through eight, Leviticus 18 and 19, God had to write this stuff down? Yeah. People were having sex with their sister and their cousin and their uncle and their, their uh, husband's, you know... Whatever. It was everything, anything goes. And it was, it causes disease. It causes the total destruction of family. Um, and not with that said, so we can be creators, but then how are you a giver? Because nothing, nothing in this life will make you a giver more than having a child, having a little baby. Nothing in this life will make you a giver more. You have no time for yourself with a baby. There's no longer, I can just do whatever I want to do. And God knew that. God has set it up this way. A man and a man cannot have a baby. They cannot. It doesn't happen. The only way... <laughs> That, that goes on is because of a heterosexual, a regular relationship. You, it's impossible. Now, with that said, if everyone on the planet was homosexual, give it a hundred years, 
and the human race would be wiped totally out. Wiped off the face of the earth. What do you think, who do you think is behind homosexuality? It's the devil. It's the enemy. In fact, homosexuality is the uh, epitome of self-absorption, of selfishness. I do what I want. I get what I want. I take what I want. It's the opposite of giving and creating. And in fact, you do not keep the only way that homosexuality and, the, and homosexuals continue to exist is by recruitment. That is the only way this still goes on. And it's been going on for centuries. The reason it hasn't taken over? Have you ever thought about that? The reason why homosexuality hasn't taken over our complete... is the only way people become homosexuals is by recruitment. They're not born into that. They're not born that way, despite what you may have heard or think or psychology might say. It's by recruitment. It's by uh, grooming and, and making someone into what you want them to be, what you think they should be. A child left to himself causes shame. And we've seen that very... Very uh, clearly. So, remember that. We have something on that. We contribute to society. They take and take and, and actually are destroying not only society, but the human race, the human body, the human condition. They destroy it. And it's, it's incredible how acceptable and how no big deal people seem to think. I'm not hurt by it. Nobody's personally getting to me through any of, of this stuff. Another thing, though, that the rabbis taught from Leviticus 20 to, I think that um, in Leviticus chapter 20, this, is, this should be said and it should be addressed, and that's that family members should not see one another naked. It, it should be addressed because this whole thing can start, just like everything else, starts in the home. And it breeds, it starts with this kind of looseness. Looseness on how you would dress. Looseness on what you think about sex. Looseness on what you might think about seeing someone naked to the point where you have nude beaches, you have people that are pretty lax, and it, it all came from the 60s and 70s free spirit movement. But really, there's, there's this departure from modesty and what it means to cover up, to teach your children. And what's funny is if people will ask, well, you know, you have a four-year-old and a five-year-old, they ba bathe together in the bath and they see each other naked. Is that wrong? What age? At what age should we really worry about family members seeing each other naked? A child will let you know. That's what's so cool. Afia will let me know. Ew, I don't want to see that. And I don't want to undress in front of them. And sadly... If that's already happened, and it's just been brushed off, it's too late. The child has already taken it on, and they, they just don't think of any big thing to see you know, family members naked or uh, all that kind of stuff. It is a lifestyle, and it has led to where now we have you know, exposing um, so much that's exposed, and... I ju that was one thing that was very interesting, I thought, as this chapter ended out, was the sight of uncovering the nakedness, seeing it. We, we talked about before, and it was really in the context of sexual relations between brothers and sisters and family members, but here it's, it's kind of uh, interesting how seeing 
it actually says, you know, that we're not to see, and you see your uh, family members in their nakedness. It, it can be detrimental. It could be a, uh, well, it's just something that ought not to be. And you would think, like I said, in all these things, what's happened to common sense? <laughs> you would think that we just know better. And like, like I said, a child will let you know. They're very bold in letting you know. <laughs> but it's important that we get these things down because this is the basic fundamentals, the foundation for everything for society, for family. All of it can be found here. I love it. I love the Lord because He keeps us from evil. He keeps us from destruction, ultimately. We desire, our flesh desires to destroy. And if left to yourself and doing what you want and what makes you feel good, you will end up destroyed. Destroying your health, destroying your family, destroying everything and everyone. But deny your flesh, deny and do what the Lord has called you to do, you start to build up and contribute to society. Contribute and give to others. And others are blessed by just being around you. Because you're not just sucking the life out of everything. And you're not just taking things from people, but rather you're giving. I love it. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. How powerful it is, Lord. Keep us from just standing by and not doing anything. Lord, keep us in Your hands. And Lord, may we know always that You know what's best. May we look to You for the answers in life. For the answers about being a godly parent, about being a godly husband, about being a godly servant. May we look to You and may we see in Your Word how clear it truly is, Lord. Keep our eyes on You. Help us to be examples for others to see how good, how gracious, how awesome you are, Lord, for you are good, greatly to be praised. Amen.